A protest song being played instead of the Chinese national anthem at an international sporting event with Hong Kong participation. The first day after the lifting of the mask mandate, but many keep their face coverings on. And in Washington, D.C., a new congressional select committee dedicated to competition with China holds its first meeting. Good evening and welcome to TVB News. A song associated with the 2019 social unrest in Hong Kong was again played instead of the Chinese national anthem during an international sporting event. This time it happened during a match between Hong Kong and Iran at the Ice Hockey World Championship held in Bosnia yesterday. We will listen to the national anthem of Hong Kong, China. On Tuesday, Hong Kong defeated Iran 11-1 during an Ice Hockey World Championships Division III match in Bosnia. When the match ended and the Chinese national anthem was supposed to be played, a song related to the 2019 anti-government protests was on instead. About nine seconds later, many Hong Kong athletes put up a tea gesture, signaling it's not the accurate anthem and it should be stopped. We are very sorry it will be corrected. Then the accurate anthem was played. The Hong Kong government has strongly deplored the mistake and demanded the Sports Federation and Olympic Committee of Hong Kong, China, conduct an in-depth investigation. That includes whether relevant sporting associations had checked on site with the event organizer to ensure the correct anthem is played as stipulated in the guidelines. The government also positively recognized the action taken by the Hong Kong athletes on the spot, which upheld national dignity. The Federation, meanwhile, said the Hong Kong Ice Hockey Association did provide the correct version to the organizer. It added the organizer had made corrections swiftly, which shows the relevant guidelines have all along been effective. It's also asked the city's Ice Hockey Association to submit a report. Still, there was no word on whether anyone went to confirm with the organizer that the right song would be played beforehand. It's believed a manager was with the Hong Kong team and they're expected to return next week. Pui Kuan Kei, Honorary Vice President of the Sports Federation and Olympic Committee of Hong Kong, China, said it could be hard to monitor from the side at the venue. According to the current guidelines, all coaches must check with the event organizer that the correct version of the national anthem will be played. If the organizer fails to play the right song, managers must tell the athletes and together with the athletes show a tea hand gesture to protest against the mistake. Executive Council convener Regina Ip doubted whether the incident was deliberate or accidental. She added that whether the incident has violated the national security law depends on the motive. Starting today, face masks are no longer required indoors, outdoors and on public transport in Hong Kong. While many are happy about the change, plenty of people have kept their masks on out of caution or habit. Jackie Lin asked members of the public for the views on masks. The first day Hong Kong bids farewell to the mask mandate, one that had been in place for nearly three years. While some couldn't wait to have a breath of fresh air, maskless. Many more have kept their face covering on. That's especially the case during rush hours at MOT MTR station, as passengers had to squeeze shoulder to shoulder, both when they waited in line and when they boarded a train, with varied views on whether to mask or not to mask. I have a little bit health problem. So if I wear a mask, I feel very difficult to breathe. So if I don't like to take my mask, that's absolutely good for me. In Russia, we cancelled masks uh, about two years ago. I'm waiting when uh, Hong Kong is opened. Right now, I don't need masks. I'm really happy about this. So many people in the train, so I will choose to take the mask for safety. People in Hong Kong have the habit of having wearing masks. Later on, I guess, uh, more often people will think it's not uh, necessary to wear it. Students too could finally go mask free for the first time in nearly three years. Again. This kindergartner said she is not anxious about the change but happy to see her friends face to face. At this primary school, many students have kept their masks on. 
Its principal said the school will continue some social distancing measures, including sitting in single rows in the near term. Meanwhile, at public hospitals and government clinics, masks are still a must for visitors and staff so as to protect the city's most vulnerable. As the city moved on from this very last symbol of COVID restrictions, the idea of a massless world or ditching your face mask on public transit like the MTR still feels a little fraught to many Hong Kongers, as you can see around me. But as mask wearing is no longer legally enforced, mask off or mask on is now an individual choice which people can decide on their own. Jackie Lin, TVB News. The quarantine camp at Penny's Bay has ceased operations from today. The unloved facility, which lasted for two years, drew to a close as the gates were locked by Under Secretary for Security Michael Chuck today. Chuck said the camp had made a lot of improvements since it first opened. Some 270,000 people were quarantined at Penny's Bay over the past two years. It will serve as a backup option and can be reused within two days if necessary. The police are continuing their search for Abby Choi's missing remains at the Northeast New Territories landfill in Takule. At around 9 a.m., several police vehicles were seen heading to the dumping ground. Authorities have expanded their search area and predicted that it may take a few days to complete the work. The dismembered body of 28-year-old Abby Choi was found in a Lungmei village rental unit in Taipo last week. Her ex-husband, along with his family members, were arrested and charged in connection with her death. Several parts of her body remain missing. U.S. concerns over China's global influence have led to a new congressional select committee dedicated to competition between the United States and the Chinese Communist Party. The first session took place on Tuesday evening, with Republicans and Democrats trying to guide lawmakers on how to strike the right balance in U.S.-China relations. David Garrett reports. Welcome, everyone, to the Select Committee's first hearing on the Chinese Communist Party's threat to America. And so begins what could determine how the U.S. may deal with China in the years ahead. We may call this a strategic competition, but it's not a polite tennis match. This is an existential struggle over what life will look like in the 21st century. Congress is divided, but both Republicans and Democrats have expressed their concerns about China recently. President Joe Biden has been on the front foot following the shooting down of a possible Chinese spy balloon, and that caught the attention of the American public. So these hearings come at a sensitive time amid long-standing disagreements over COVID, tech and Taiwan. We must deter the aggression by the CCP. We do not want a war with the PRC, not a Cold War, not a hot war. We don't want a clash of civilizations, but we seek a durable peace, and that is why we have to deter aggression. Opponents on the Democratic side voice concerns the committee could stir up anti-Chinese and anti-Asian sentiment. Some watching from the sidelines were worried too. This speaker was heckled by a protester and proceedings had to be halted. Why don't you pause for a second, you'll be given okay. additional time. But when former National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster continued, he was halted again as a man shouted that the world needs cooperation and peace. Your sign, your sign is upside down. Some applauded the intrusion, but most in the room booed another interruption. Later, a naturalized U.S. citizen, dissident and human rights advocate was invited to speak. In the U.S., we need to face the fact that we have helped to feed the baby dragon of the CCP until it has grown into what it now is. Since the 1990s, U.S. companies have enriched themselves by exploiting cheap labor in China and have in the process also enriched the CCP. The lawmakers will push seven bills on policy towards China. The statements were broadcast at prime time on the East Coast on U.S. news channels. China is watching, as is the world. David Garrett, TVB News. The United States is ratcheting up national security concerns over the popular video sharing app TikTok, which is owned by Beijing-based ByteDance. U.S. federal employees have been told that they have 30 days to delete the app from their government-issued mobile phones, citing espionage fears. Canada and the European Commission have implemented similar bans, but an American politician is opposing the new measures. Tracy Furness reports. 
A top Democrat on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Gregory Meeks, strongly opposed the legislation that will give President Joe Biden the power to ban Chinese-owned video sharing app TikTok and other apps. Meeks says it will damage allegiances across the globe, bring more companies into China's sphere, destroy jobs in the United States and undercut free speech and free enterprise. The committee opened debate Tuesday on the measure seeking to ban the ByteDance-owned app that is used by more than 100 million Americans. The committee delayed a vote on the measures until Wednesday. Canada and the European Commission and the EU Council have also bans in place, citing espionage fears and growing concerns that China's government could harvest users' data. And the European Parliament has become the latest EU body to ban TikTok from staff phones. But how serious is the threat, and should TikTok users who are not government be worried about the app? Anton Dabura, executive director of the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute, says there is a legitimate reason for concern. It, it may seem innocuous for some who may say, well, I'm not doing anything, you know, I'm not working in a nuclear power plant or things like that. But there are so many ways that, um, that foreign actors, especially the Chinese, but not limited to them, can make use of these little breadcrumbs that we leave so that um, even though most of us think that we're not doing anything that would be of interest to a foreign government, that's not really true. Beijing has regularly denied having intentions to harvest data. As the world's top superpower, how unsure of itself can the U.S. be to fear a young people's favorite app to such a degree? The U.S. has been overstretching the concept of national security and abusing state power to suppress other countries' companies. We firmly oppose those wrong actions, said Mao Ning, spokesperson for the Chinese Foreign Ministry, in a news briefing Tuesday. TikTok has said the bans were misguided and based on fundamental misconceptions. India, too, has banned the app throughout the country. Tracy Furness, TVB News. Still ahead on tonight's news, a train collision in Greece leaves more than 30 dead. And a survey suggests local job applicants more demanding than before. Elsewhere, two trains have collided in Greece, killing at least 32 people and injuring many more. A passenger service with over 300 people on board hit a freight train near the city of Larissa just before midnight local time. The first two cars of the Athens to Thessaloniki train caught fire after impact. Two other carriages derailed. The cause of the crash is not yet known. It's thought many young people were on the overnight service. Emergency services have been working through the night and are using cranes to try to find any survivors in the wreckage. Three days of national mourning have been declared. As Hong Kong gradually returns to normality after the COVID pandemic, a study conducted by an online employment company has found that job applicants are now seeking more demands from employers. The study also revealed the labour market's balance of power has shifted to job applicants. Timothy Lee tells us more. As Hong Kong's unemployment rate continues to drop, many industries, such as the tourism and hotel sectors, have since faced difficulties in making new hires. A study conducted by an online employment company that surveyed more than 90,000 respondents across Southeast Asia found that job seekers have increasingly prioritized work-life balance in a post-pandemic world. More than 60 percent of respondents from Hong Kong see a stable job with good work-life balance as the ideal career path, while over 50 percent said they would turn down an attractive job offer if they have a negative experience during the recruitment process. The recruitment company believes that it may take over a year before the labor shortage situation sees any improvement, and more traditional employers in the city may have to change their hiring methods. I think there's still a, probably you know, a, a gap, I think in particular about local traditional Hong Kong companies that are more traditional in the way their work policies, in the way their, 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 their work model. So I think if they adapt and get on board with these changes, 
then I think it will ultimately benefit them in being able to attract the right talent. Lee added that employers can attract more talent by enticing them with offers such as a hybrid work model. The report says close to 70% of Hong Kongers receive job offers multiple times a year, with those in the IT sector having even more offers. With such high numbers, residents are encouraged to be more confident when negotiating with employers in terms of their demands. Timothy Lee, TVB News. And that's the news. Thanks for watching.